So we've been going through the book of Psalms this summer here at ICF, um, and it's been a really good time just to go through these Psalms that are really about <clears throat> how do we worship God, you know, and, and some of these Psalms can really tell us about who we are and who God is. So today we're uh, in Psalm 90, Psalm 90. So let's read that together. <clears throat> Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, turn back, you mortals. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. You sweep them away. They are like a dream like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Turn, O Lord, how long? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love so that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us and as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper us, prosper for us the work of our hands. Oh, prosper the work of our hands. This is the word of the Lord. So, Psalm 90, uh, Moses wrote this psalm, and he wrote this in the desert, in the wilderness. While, while a lot of the Israelites were suffering and had died around him because this was a 40-year period of wandering in the wilderness for the Israelites, this, this psalm is called A Prayer of Moses, the Man of God. Uh, it, it was probably written a lot before, many years before all the other psalms, like the ones written by David, for example. So it's, it's probably the oldest psalm that we have in the Bible. And it, it, was, it was written for these people who were wandering in the wilderness for years and years and years. It, it was probably something that was told orally by orators, you know, around a campfire. You can, you can imagine uh, this psalm being told in schools for children alongside the Torah uh, in, in this context of being in the desert in the wilderness. So it was probably important for Israelite identity and how they understood God. Moses led his people out of Egypt, out of slavery, what well, God did through Moses. And you can imagine his frustration uh, maybe being downcast at times during this long period. No doubt he, he, he understood in this psalm we can see how, how amazing God was in comparison to, to humans, in comparison to the Israelites. So Moses acknowledges in, in verse 1 at the beginning that the Lord has been our dwelling place from generation to generation. The Hebrews were, were still very much without a home up to this point in history, and their only safe place was with God. Uh, not only is, is our home earth, but God created that, and so our home really is with God. And the, the Hebrews struggled a lot during their time in the wilderness, we know from the Bible. They complained about not having enough meat, even though God was providing enough for them through the manna. Uh, they complained about their situation. They even cried out to God, why did we even leave Egypt? Why did we leave? Why are we here? At least there we had meat. And the, the Hebrews also refused to enter into the land of Canaan, the promised land, 
when Caleb and Joshua tried to encourage them to follow God's command through Moses and go into this new land in the face of danger because they were afraid. So these wanderers' lives were cut short short during this 40 years of their pilgrimage because of their disobedience, it says in the Bible. All of the Israelites who rebelled against God refused to go into this land, passed away by the time Moses had seen the promised land. So Moses saw a lot of a lot of people dying around him. He, he, he must have been in a really difficult place. Moses writes here about the greatness of God and our smallness, our weakness, the holiness of God, the goodness of God, and, and how insignificant we are in comparison to him. We're bound by time, by the earth, by suffering, by pain, and, and God is, is light. So this, so this psalm really puts humans in our place, doesn't it? And God in his place. It makes me think of worship. Uh, The true intent of worship is when we put aside our lives, the things that we worry about, and we really worship God for his holiness, his otherness, his greatness, his goodness. Worship is that time when we realize that we are pretty insignificant. And the only comfort we can find is in God and his love, his satisfying love. This psalm is a reminder of us, for us as well, of the jealousy of God and of his wrath. He commands us, he he doesn't just want us to, he commands us that we worship him only. Him alone, no other gods. He commands that we rely, rely only on him for our comfort, for our sustenance, to keep us going. So we're talking about these Israelites being stuck in the wilderness for a long time. They, uh, in this period of time, they've kept up their patterns of being lost, uh, even when God is trying to provide for them a way out. And I think some of us might be going through a similar thing, maybe with sin, maybe with struggle. Uh, Do any of you seem like you keep getting lost in sin, keep getting stuck in the wilderness of sin? This sin might be something that your, your body, that your mind is just so used to doing that you just keep doing it on repeat mode. It's just natural. This continues. This sin might be something you always do when you're out with your friends. It might be something that you can't imagine life without. When you keep going in these circles, continuing to sin in the wilderness, it gets hard to have hope uh, that, that you can stop right? Because you just can continue over and over. Uh, And just like the Israelites, it can be easier to continue to suffer in the desert, easier to continue in the wilderness because of these old patterns, because they're normal. It can be easier to do that than to accept that God is the only one who can get us out. He's our savior, not just from eternal death, not just giving us eternal life, uh, but also he's our savior from sin. He can save us from living a life of sin and wants to lead us out into the promised land, the promised land of freedom, forgiveness, of holiness. So in the last few months, uh, I've been leading a Bible study in in a city called Smedrevo. Uh, It's about an hour away from Belgrade. And I've mentioned this before. We, we've been going through the Ten Commandments, but in reverse, starting with number 10. And these Ten Commandments were handed down on Mount Sinai to, to Moses. God gave them to Moses on the mountain, and he gave them to the Israelites. And this happened shortly after the Israelites were led out of Egypt and before this period of wilderness that we're talking about in this psalm. And in going through these commandments, we, we really see, starting with 10, how there's a lot of ways in which we can sin as humans, sin against each other, sin against God. And over these last few months, going through these commandments, uh, it's been interesting because we're talking about like a, a new group, people who are new Christians or maybe not Christians yet, maybe people who are Orthodox who are interested in learning more about God and go to this Bible study. And each week, it's been great to share about these Ten Commandments 
because they're really good guidelines for us for a holy life. These were given to God's people to give them order when, once they came out of Egypt, and they, they can really give us life um, in order for, to help us live in harmony with each other, with God. And in the middle of this series of Ten Commandments, we had a short break when my son was born in March. Bo was born, and then when, when we came back to this Bible study, we did a little lesson about what does it mean to be born again. And um, being born again means having new life in the Spirit, about being a new creation in Christ. And I, I taught this at this Bible study, and it was kind of frustrating because the people really were not interested, it seemed like. Um, they just weren't interested in, in this topic about being born again. They listened, didn't really have any questions. And after that, we had less people come to the Bible study. And it was a little frustrating. So I've been thinking maybe, maybe these people are only interested in learning. Maybe they're only interested in talking about the Bible in a knowledge-based kind of way. Maybe they don't really want to follow Jesus truly. But we continue to teach the Bible, continue to teach these commandments, and just prayed that God would work in the lives of these people as, as we teach, as we're obedient. And getting back into the text, so in verse 12 of this psalm, we begin to see the kind of life that seizes the moment. Uh, it says in verse 12, teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So what does it mean for us to number our, our days? We know what it means to count our calories, uh, you know, count, count our schedule. What's, what's our schedule for the week? Uh, but do we really realize that life is very short and a short life should be spent wisely? A, a life should be used for eternal good. We need to apply ourselves to loving God and serving God. So we have to take advantage of, of really every day, live life to the fullest, seize the moment, and, and live life to the fullest. That is a life lived in relationship with God. A full life, a complete life, is a life in relationship with God, personal relationship. So going to verse 14, I, I wonder what, what would it look like if we prayed this verse every day in the morning when we woke up? before you drink your coffee or check your phone. It says, verse 14, God, satisfy me with your love, with your unfailing love, that I may sing for joy and be glad all my days. So real satisfaction only can come from God. He has conquered death, given us new life in Jesus. That's what to, to be born again means. Our wisdom, our head knowledge in the Bible or what we know, it's not enough to spend our days wisely or to spend our day for good, to just know. We have to walk with Jesus in resurrection life, new life through the Holy Spirit. We can ask for satisfaction from God and through salvation in Jesus, we can be refreshed through the Holy Spirit. And this refreshment from God's presence has no comparison. Only when we live a life that is good enough to remember, good enough for our children and grandchildren to remember and to cherish, this kind of life only comes through a relationship with God. So getting back to Smith and Abel, we, we continued with these Ten Commandments. And over the last couple months, uh, we've get, gotten into the first few commandments, going from ten all the way down to one. And uh, the first two commandments are, are really about who God is. The, you know, 10 through 5 are about sins that we can commit against each other. So they're about living in harmony. And 1 and 2 are really about um, who is God. In the first two commandments, um, I'll start with number 2, since we've been going backwards in this study. Number 2 is God commands us not to worship any idols, not to have any idols, right? Number one is God commands us not to worship any other gods. So these commandments tell us that, that our God is a jealous God. He wants us only to worship him. He's, uh, he's the one who is our deliverer, our redeemer, our savior. 
He lifted us up out of slavery. He delivered us from Egypt. And he demands that we worship him alone. So we need to recognize God for, for who, he, who he truly is. And allow him to be the Lord of our life. To put him first. This is like the, the first commandment. Don't worship any other gods. This is putting him first. Number one in our life. At the beginning. Maybe, maybe we have the wrong idea about God. It's important to have a good understanding of who he is. So number one, he's our deliverer and, and our redeemer, our savior. Number two, we need to recognize God's concern for us, that he loves us, that he cares for us. Number three, we need to recognize God's demands. And number four, recognize that God wants the fullest possible relationship with us. So God, God won't put up with being compartmentalized into a little compartment called spiritual, a little compartment called church. <clears throat> he, wants, he wants a full relationship with us, the fullest possible. So given this understanding of God and who he is, we, we really have to review our lives. Um, and these commandments aren't, aren't about do's and don'ts. Um, but they're really about how do we have the fullest possible relationship with Jesus. It's not that God wants us to do the right things. He wants us to have a right relationship with him. <clears throat> so the hope of this psalm is that we serve a God who's always with us. He's always there to guide us in times of trouble, in times of sin, in times of wilderness. I would even say that in, in these times of difficulty, God is even more with us because it's during these times that many of us will make decisions to follow him. God, um, and, and when we look back at our past, when, when we can look back at how God delivered us and God saved us during these difficult times, we can, uh, we can know how to go through the next difficult time. So if you're stuck on repeat mode, if you keep going back and back again to sin over and over, back again into the wilderness instead of following God out of the wilderness, the good news is that Jesus has already taken that sin with him on the cross. He's already taken the sting and the power of that sin. He's defeated it in the act of giving his life for each one of us on the cross. So that's the hope. So in, in this Bible study that we've been going through in Smedrevo, we've been reading a book by a guy named J. John, Anglican uh, pastor. And he was, in, in one of his sermons recently, he was talking about how he reads scripture and he imagines certain scenarios, like what if it were different or certain things, what if certain things happened. And he had this this uh, dream, I guess, or something, something that he imagined about John the Baptist when Jesus goes and gets baptized by John before Jesus starts his ministry. And so he imagined what if, we can all imagine together, what if John the Baptist had a childhood friend who was a really successful businessman and he came out with all the people the big crowd came out to the wilderness to where John was baptizing people. And he saw the big crowds of people and he went up to John and he said, Hey, John, I think we need to implement some organization here. I'm a successful businessman. So what if we have tables where people, people can wait in line and, and go to a table and they can get a name tag with a sticker and they can write their name and their biggest sin. The, the sin they struggle with the most. What if people do that so that they have this name tag on their chest so that when they go to you, John, in the water, you'll be ready. Like you can do this faster. You can say, oh, this is so-and-so and this is their sin. And so um, this is to make things go quicker, right? So people come up to the table. We have uh, Juanita. They write down Juanita. My name is Juanita. They write down her name. What's your biggest sin? She says, 
my sig- biggest sin is I'm a liar. I lie. So they write liar, put it on our chest. Then Rob comes up. Rob, what's your biggest sin? Rob says, uh, I steal. I'm a thief. So they write Rob, thief, put it on his chest. Jake comes up. Jake says, my biggest sin, sin is that I covet. I covet my neighbor. So they write Jake. He's a, a coveter. Put it on his chest. Anna comes up. She says, my biggest sin, I'm an adulterer. Put it on her chest. And we can go through this with all of, the, all of these commandments. Um, so, Sophie, a murderer. Adrian, a dishonorer of his parents. Alex, a Sabbath breaker. And then Jesus comes up. Jesus arrives. He sees all these people with their name tags and stickers. Jesus comes up and they say, what's your name? Jesus says, my name's Jesus. What's your biggest sin? He says, none. And they say, what? What do you mean? What? You don't have any, any sin. What are you talking about? He says, none. I don't have any sin. So they put Jesus, none, on his chest. And then Jesus comes up and he looks around near the water and he says, Juanita, liar, give me your badge. I'll put it on my chest. And he comes up, he takes Rob's, Rob's badge. He's a thief, puts it on his chest. He takes Jake's badge, the coverter, puts it on his chest. Anna's, Anna's badge, the adulterer, takes it. Adrian's badge, the murderer, Sophie, the dishonorer of parents, Alex, the Sabbath breaker, takes all these sins, puts them on his chest, and then he says, John, you can baptize me now. So Jesus has taken all of our sin already. It's gone. It's gone on the cross. The, the sting of it, the power of it, the addiction of it does not have to have a hold on us because he has taken it. He has that power. And it's already gone. So really, God is wanting to lead each and every one of us out of the wilderness, if that's where we find ourselves right now. He wants to take our hand and say, hey, your sin's already gone. You don't have to do it anymore. Come with me. Come into the promised land. Live the type of life that I want you to live, that you want to live. A life that's completely surrendered to God, completely given over to God. So I said earlier that I've been a little frustrated at this Bible study, right? After teaching about being born again and not really getting much feedback, less people coming. In the last few weeks, more people have started to come. It's been a little bit more encouraging. And actually this afternoon, we'll finish this series and we'll talk about the first commandment there later today. And last week, last Sunday, uh, I taught about the second commandment and I was really surprised. One of the guys who's only come like three times, he had this question. He said, Hey, uh, is there something else that happens after being saved? He said, is there some type of a vision or imagination or dream of some type of a walk with God that's different? than just being saved. And I was so surprised that he asked that question. And I said, yes. And so I talked to him about John Wesley and his, uh, what he called entire sanctification, holiness, uh, walking with God in a pure, holy way in which God has led us out of this wilderness and we're walking with him and sin doesn't have any power over us. So, I'll talk a little bit about John Wesley. He was the father of Methodism, English guy. Um, He was in the Anglican church, and he experienced something that he called entire sanctification, kind of like a second work of grace. It takes place after initially being saved, after the initial justification of relationship with God, a second work that takes place where we really walk in faith with Jesus it's really a life where, uh, where sin doesn't have a hold over us anymore, where we don't have to be in repeat mode um, and continuing these things that we struggle with. Um, and this is something that happens. It can happen gradually as, 
as Jesus makes us aware of, of sin in our life over our, over our lifetime, it can also happen in an instant where we feel like we're completely free, you know, completely free of addiction to drugs or whatever it is. And this, this is a walk with God in holiness. It's God's holiness that is evident so much in our life that we're, we're really in the promised land, I guess. And through this kind of being a Christian, truly walking with God, giving up everything, giving him every area of our life, we can live in a way that sin doesn't have an effect on us. We can live in a way that we can truly say that God has saved us, lifted us up out of Egypt, out of slavery, out of the wilderness, into the kind of life that God has promised us, eternal life, kingdom life pure life, holy life, life in the spirit. So God wants to do a new work in all of us here. He wants us to follow him out of our state of sin and into a new state of hope. He's knocking at the door. He's wanting us to to follow him, to follow him out of our patterns of sin on repeat. So there's a prayer that John Wesley wrote it's called the covenant prayer, the covenant prayer. It's, it's really powerful. And if, if you are someone who wants to have a new kind of walk with Jesus in holiness, if you want to really surrender everything to God, I invite you to pray this prayer and to make this covenant with God. This is the covenant prayer by John Wesley. Look it up. So here it is. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praised for you or criticized for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven. Amen.